Hi, my name is Tim, Tim James. I'm a glass bead maker and instructor, and really even more than that. But um, for the purposes of this video, we'll just stick to that, see what happens. Um, I live here in Tuscany, Italy with, uh, with my wife Lily, who's a, a jewelry designer. And she's also the one that got me into glass bead making. Una vita fa, a long time ago, uh, in 2002 actually, um, just after we moved here from the States. And uh, I, I took this course and, you know, good times, a lot of good wine, a lot of good food, um, not much in the way of, of uh, glass speed making. I don't know, seemed a bit odd, but, you know, at least I was having fun, good memories. Um, uh, so really, over the next two, three years, working by myself in my studio, using YouTube and, and, and that kind of thing, um, videos online, books, um, uh, and then lots of uh, trial and error, um, you know, that's, you know, I'm self-taught, basically. And, 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 but once I settled in, um, I really felt comfortable, you know, in that creative process. Uh, and, and it is. It's a very unique way uh, to create. Um, and then teaching uh, from 2005, that too, that's its own type of craft. Um, finding some way to verbalize what you mean in many different ways, really, because not everybody, we don't all hear things in the same way so as to get that clear picture. Um, uh, it's, it's really one of the reasons I wanted to make this tutorial series. For many years I've been thinking about it. Um, this idea that, that, that I, could, I, could, I could capture um, uh, the, the, the bead making process from my perspective uh, in terms of at the torch. Um, and uh, to be honest, I'm pleased with this one because, you know, it, it's... it's uh, it's come together in a way that I really feel like does emulate um, a one-on-one -on -one class uh, in, a, in kind of an intimate way, um, which, again, I'm pleased about. So hopefully you will be as well. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, your comments after the fact uh, um, so, as, so that I can learn, too, as to, as to uh, how to best present this information um, in, the, in the next series. So this is video series one, uh, and it's got all the, the, the basic foundation stuff. So, so uh, um, after this, we'll be continuing on uh, in lots of different uh, um, uh, directions, but always using that same foundation. So watch this one, and then, and, and then let me know what you think about it. I appreciate it, have fun. All right, let's make a glass bead, shall we? The magical, mystical world of glass bead making. Dun, dun, dun. Look, so this is a Nortel minor bench burner, uh, and it has a graphite pad mounted to it. That's um, incredibly useful. The best 25 bucks I ever spent in my life. Um, if you don't have one, I would highly recommend it. Um, but even if you do not, obviously we can use the paddle, other graphite surfaces, that kind of thing. Woo, six and one. Um, now this is a propane oxygen surface mix torch, which means that uh, the gases, when they exit, mix at this point. Therefore, this is the hottest point in the flame. It's also the dirtiest because the gases are mixing right there. So, honestly, you almost never want to work there. You, you usually want to work from about here out, depending on what you're doing. Most of the time, when you're melting glass, you'll be here. When you're just sort of maintaining a shape, uh, keeping it warm, you'll be, uh, you know, in this area, that kind of thing. Every once in a while, if you want to boil glass for an effect, you'll work low. But um, it tends to, um, it's dirty. And so you'll, you can end up with uh, 
uh, scum, uh, especially on, in, on the transparents. Um, so, boom. From here out is usually your best bet. If you see scum on your beads, it probably just means that you're focusing so much on, on, on making the bead that you didn't realize that you dipped too low and got too close to this point. So scum on your beads uh, is often an indicator of that. Diddy, now you know. It could also mean that you need to sit a little closer to the workbench so that you can comfortably reach that clean part of the flame. Scoot up a little bit. Propane is a gas, comes in a canister, relatively inexpensive, lasts for a long time. I like it. Uh, oxygen. Years ago in our Florence studio, I would use these gigantic oxygen tanks that were under God knows how many hundreds of pounds of pressure, and they'd wheel them into my studio, and you know, I'm sure the neighbors above always, you know, were concerned. <laughs> but um, nowadays, uh, and for many years actually, I, I have an um, oxygen generator. Uh, it's a 10 liter per minute generator that um, does just that. It makes air. Nice. The thing is, when the machine is on, and it's on right now over there, you can hear it, um, it's not a holding tank, so it really needs uh, a place, uh, an escape valve. Uh, and that's what the, the, the torch is. Uh, I can feel the cool air coming out right now, the oxygen's leaving the oxygen generator, which is great. But something to keep in mind, um, whenever the machine's on, I have this uh, valve, the oxygen valve, open because uh, if you have it closed a lot while the machine is running, it potentially can damage the little bits and pieces that make the machine work because the, the internal air doesn't have an escape route. Um, so keep it open. And um, really, the only time you close it while it's on is just before lighting it, okay? So that's what we'll do now. I'm gonna use a big lighter to light this. Often people will say, no, use a, you know, like a, one of those things that you click and it creates a spark because it's safer to have at your workstation than a Bic because a piece of glass potentially, right? It's unlikely, but it's possible that, that a piece of hot glass could land on here and then you'd be in trouble. Um, and that's true. And so safety first and all that stuff. But what I do is use a Bic and then put it in a drawer or behind the vase or something like that. Uh, just because those clickers, I find them to be kind of dangerous. Um, I, I, I turn the gas on, gas is now escaping into the room and I'm clicking that thing trying to get it to spark the whole time feeling like Jesus, when it finally does, it's gonna be an explosion. This is simple. You light that, you hold it, just underneath the exit port, you turn the oxygen or the propane, but just a tiny little bit. It just needs to be open a little, Whoa, like that. And the reason that it, that it lit so cleanly and nicely is because the oxygen was already open. Okay? And so in real life, when I'm not teaching people, I do it that way. I always have this oxygen open. The machine is running and generating, and uh, when I add propane to it, doot, it's already ready to go, okay? I think for safety's sake, I suppose uh, what people will say is you have that both valves closed, okay? Now I add my little bit of propane, and then I add oxygen after the fact. So let's just pretend I didn't mention any of that other stuff and just do it that way because it's just so safe. This is going to go in a drawer. Now we're protected. Uh, okay, now where do we want this to be if flame-wise? Uh, that's nice, just like that. That's a great, that's a great, uh, that's a great flame. Um, a, a flame that isn't as great is something like that. Uh, that's a dirty gas mix. 
and you'll end up with dirty beads. Um, they'll be scummy and they're not even nice looking. It's not like some organic, fascinating, oh, isn't that cool kind of thing. They're just unpleasant to look at, usually. So, this is good. If it's hissy, if you're hearing a lot of hiss, uh, then that's probably uh, too much oxygen, you know, oxygen rich. Um, that could be used for some things like uh, oxidizing when you're using silver and whatnot, but um, that's further down the road, so we won't even get into that at the moment. Uh, so this is nice. Let's call that good. Now, we talked a bit earlier about the um, how to hold a mandrel, right? These two fingers are basically it's resting, and then I'm turning, 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 turning clockwise, if you look at it like that. Uh, or from this perspective, I'm pulling the glass from the glass rod to build my base bead, right? And it's better to be working a little bit closer, closer this way, rather than further back this way, because from back here, it's difficult to control. It's difficult to pull that thread. And when you do, you don't pull it as nicely. So work a little bit further up. This gets hot. The heat moves down a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't burn. I mean, uh, you feel a little bit warm, and if you're uncomfortable, back it up a little bit, okay? But work as close to the, to the front as you can, just because that'll give you more control, all right? And the area that we're going to be working on, I mentioned before that this steel rod, the mandrel, has been dipped into... Um, bead release, which is whatever, liquid graphite or something, and then it dries, uh, or you can flame dry it as well if, if you're in a hurry to bead, bead, bead. Um, and we need to warm that work area up so that the glass will stick to it. If it's, if it's not warm and you got a nice gather of glass and you go touch, it just won't stick. So it, it has to be nice and warm and equally warm throughout the, the, the body of the work area. And I say work area meaning in here somewhere, the center part. I don't want to work too close to the edge because then sometimes your bead goes longer than you plan and you got this, you, you run out of bead, you run out of mandrel, right? It's trouble. Or the other way too, it's just, uh, it's a pain. So I like to work, you know, somewhere in there, in the middle. And we need to warm the work area up, but I can't just hold it in the flame because it'll burn and it will crack and weaken uh, the bead release so that it'll either break right away or it'll break, you know, when, when you're in the middle of like the greatest bead that you've ever made in your life and then you'll, you'll be devastated. So, We'll just try to avoid that by properly warming that work area. And we do that by uh, always rotating this mandrel, right? I'm rotating and I'm bouncing in and out of the flame. And the reason I rotate is because I want the heat to be hitting it in different spots. I don't want the heat just in one spot. So if I rotate it and bounce in and out, you can see when I'm making contact with that flame, right? If I do that, then all of that work area, all the way around, will become equally warm, okay? So that's what I want to do, and how do I know when it's ready? When it does that. It starts to flash orange. Then I, I know that it will accept the glass, okay? Now I need to get the glass rod ready. When I'm doing that, I need to keep warming that uh, work area on the mandrel. So basically you just want to get into this habit of rotating and bouncing out in and out of the, the flame. And that's true also once you have your glass in place because soft glass uh, gets cool very quickly. So you really need to always be keeping that work area warm and then 
keep the glass warm once it's on there. Uh, if you don't, then the, the, the glass will cool. Like if you're over here and you're focusing on this and then you come back to the flame with your, your cool glass there, the glass can shock and crack and bits and pieces fall off and uh, it's not that nice. So it doesn't explode or anything, but it's, it's, it's uh, less than efficient. So um, that's like rule number one, if there are rules, which there aren't, by the way. But if there were, one of them would be to constantly be bouncing in and out of the flame to keep your mandrel and or your glass warm. Not hot, not molten, but warm, okay? Now, while we're doing that, we're gonna, we're gonna um, prepare our glass rod, build up a, a ball of glass, and then transfer that glass onto the mandrel so, as, so that that can begin to be the foundation of our bead, okay? Now, if I stick this glass rod, jam it right in there to heat it up, it's a, it's a pretty good thickness, and I'm going right at the hottest part of the flame. So what will happen almost certainly is it'll go and pieces will jump a, a, around, okay? So you don't want to do that necessarily. It seems unsafe. So instead, a good way, a safe way to introduce the rod to the flame is, is two things. One, if I go like this, little bits and pieces will jump off and they'll go that way. So they'll, ooh, there's one right there, see? And even smaller pieces go further than, you know, it could land in my arm and then it's like, it hurts a little bit. Not bad, but still. And instead of having that happen, since it usually does, enter the flame this way. Point the glass rod away from you, right? And down towards your work surface, whatever it is. Mine's marble because I'm in Italy. But um, if you point it down, then little bits and pieces can, can go all over as they like and it won't matter, okay? Also, don't start so low where it's hotter. Introduce it higher so that it has an opportunity to warm up and become acclimated to the heat, okay? Some glass colors, like ivory, for example, a thick rod of ivory, this uh, diameter, pops, potentially pops like crazy. And I think it's just because it's such a complex color. Um, clear and black and, you know, this yellow, they tend to not be as poppy. But still, you want to be careful and just want to get into the habit of, of introducing your flame or your glass rod to the flame up high, you're pointing it away, and you're just kind of slowly tapping the tip in and out, okay? And then once you can tell that it's not going to be poppy, then you can move that more down into a, 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 a comfortable work position. And since my goal is to build up a ball of glass on the end of the rod, which is called a gather. I'm going to hold this glass rod at kind of a sharp angle so that the glass has an opportunity to ball up on the end. Now, I'm not rotating the glass rod, all because that's, you know, rotating both just makes me seasick to even think about it. So, what I'm doing instead is the glass is starting to melt, right? So I turn it up, I rotate it like halfway up, and it starts to drip again, and then I rotate it halfway up. So, you know, so I just, it drips and I catch it. It drips and I catch it. See what I'm saying? And then it starts to build up into a gather, into a ball. And that's what I'm looking for, okay? So I'm doing two things at once. It's like rubbing your head and your stomach and it can be a little annoying and odd at first. Believe me, it's that, it's that way for me and for everybody in the beginning. Um, but you find your balance and it all works out. So I now would like to transfer this glass, right? Got plenty of it. So what am I going to do? 
I'm going to leave the flame. I'm going to let that glass cool just a bit. I'm going to touch that work area. I pull, create some distance between the two, which creates a thread. And then I turn or pull with my left hand, pull the glass from the glass rod in a nice thread. Okay, and you'll see that my glass rod, the back of the glass rod is at the back of the flame. Okay, and that allows the glass to continue to flow. However, it's not in the flame because if it's in the flame, it'll cut the thread. And I'll show you another pass of glass, and that's what I call them. I, each one is a pass. Okay, keeping that bead warm, right? Rotating it, rotating it, bouncing in and out, making sure it stays warm, but not molten, not hot, just warm. Moist, I say sometimes, just for fun. And I'm ready with another gather. So I leave the flame, right? I touch this from the side. I create some distance, which creates that thread. And then I pull the glass from the glass rod in this way. And again, the glass rod itself, just the back of it, is at the back of the, uh, of the flame. If, you, if it's too hot, the flame's going to get thin or it's going to be cut. So if, if your thread is thin, then try staying out of the flame more. Work a little cooler and see how that goes for you. Um, also, that big pause, like right now, pause and then touch and then pull and then turn. That big pause makes a big difference because if you don't pause, then the thread that you send, the thread of glass, is going to be very thin and it really won't be very productive. Um, you'll be sending a small amount of glass and it won't, it won't um, build up very much. So that big pause, I should get a big sign, put it above, above the station. Pause! It's important. I'll do it one more time. Pause, pause, and then touch, and then pull away, create some distance, and turn, turn, turn. And you see how I am, my left hand is, all the movement is coming from the left hand, okay? The, the glass rod stationary at the back of the flame. The glass rod, I mean the, the bead itself, and my left hand, that's where I'm pulling the glass, I'm, I'm rotating so as to pull the glass from the glass rod, and I go left to right so that the thread, like a, like a, a thread and bobbin, will, will lay across the surface rather than just go straight up, it goes left to right, left to right. I'll do one more, one, it's getting to be a big bead, but we'll do one more just so I can demonstrate that point in case it's not obvious. How would I know? I know what I'm talking about, I think. All right, check that out. You see what I'm saying? Left to right, left to right, left to right, okay? It's a gigantic bead. It's massive. All right, so we want to melt that bead down into a beautiful finished foundational bagel shaped type bead. A couple of things to keep in mind. This glass rod stays very hot for a while. So I always put it in the same way, hot end out, and I always grab cool end first, or from here. Is that clear? Always get into a routine so you're always doing it in the same way so that you don't even think about it anymore. Obviously you don't want to be grabbing that hot end. If it's, if it's always the hot end out, then I'm always grabbing the cool end, um, even if I'm in a stupor when I'm working, which certainly happens. And then the bead itself, I, I want to 
switch to my right hand because my right hand is my strong hand. Um, but I, 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 I want to make sure and switch over the workstation, over the marble. Because if it falls, it doesn't make any difference. If I totally spaz out and drop it, fine, whatever. I just pick it up again, move on with my day. If, in, on the other hand, if I switch over here, if I change hands over my lap and it falls, it's a completely different story. You're racing around, you're, you're, you're trying to not have it be in your lap. You also don't necessarily want it sitting on the floor since it's a very hot piece of glass. Um, there's a lot of good reasons not to have that happen. So we avoid it by always changing hands over our work area, okay? Now this is one of my favorite bits. And this comes from hollow core bead making. Uh, years ago, I had a gigantic order. I was, I was, I had been bead making for um, three years, I guess, two and a half years or so, and we moved from Lucca, Italy, which is in Tuscany, uh, to Florence, Italy. And when we did the uh, the glass gods of Italy. And these things only happen in Italy, by the way. I mean, this is, it never would have happened to me in the States. I got this gigantic job uh, making thousands of beads for Chanel. And, and the, bulk, the bulk of them were hollow core beads. Um, if you don't know, it basically just means that, that they're beads that are hollow at the core, core, so they have less glass, so they weigh less. And making all of those beads for months and months and months and then continuing on after because I enjoy the process I started to it's a special way of working with glass when you make uh, hollow core beads because you really have to it's very fine and you're using the heat in a very special way and 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 uh, I started to realize that I could take the the same uh, uh, steps uh, and, and, and same um, idea and apply it towards all the beads that I make because my beads were very consistent once I got comfortable making hollow core beads uh, the beads themselves were very consistent the way that, that it was a very controlled process the melt process and everything so at some point I just started doing it with all the beads that I make and that's and I've been doing that for years and years and years so I work with glass in a, in a in maybe a different way than other people because of the fact that I had that order at the beginning of my career and and it just uh, steered me into this this way of, of working that I find very harmonic or harmonic is even better because it's the proper way to say the word but it's 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 it's, it's working in harmony with the forces that be, gravity and, and, and whatnot. Um, meaning that, that I'm not forcing anything. I'm just, I'm, I'm working with uh, the process rather than, than demanding it do something. You know what I'm saying? And what I mean by that is, like the melt process, for example, I want to heat. Glass always does the same thing as it melts. It heads towards the heat source and then it starts to drip. Now, if I hold my mandrel nice and straight and I heat the exterior of the bead in, so I'm, 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 I'm heating uh, the exterior first all the way to the core. I'm not heating the core first because then it'll just sort of collapse into a blob. I'm heating the exterior first, so I'm just working right on the surface of the flame. I'm just touching it with the exterior of my bead and a very slow rotation. And that slow rotation and that contact, you can see I'm trying to stay right in the center of that, of that flame. And, and by doing so, if I just continue on with this process, the glass is melting, it's heading towards the heat, it's falling, and I'm catching it with, the, with my very slow rotation, and it starts to become more and more liquid, and when it does finally become fully liquid, uh, I can feel in my fingertips 
when it's when it's balanced and true because it just quickly the the rotation of it just speeds up and and you find yourself floating with it you just you know you allow for it it's a slow um, uh, rotation at first to incrementally allow for the process but then once it gets to that point of being molten and balanced you can feel it in your fingertips and that's the point to leave the flame but do not change your movements one iota okay allow that bead to go from molten to solid because once it does you've got yourself a very nice balanced and centered foundational bead that's got nice dimpled ends that the that, that, that jewelry designers love uh, and the balance itself is always so consistent I mean it really it's a great way to uh, to to work with glass and it's, it's a great glass and it's, it's a great way to uh, very consistently start with a true foundation so if I was going to start decorating now and and or flattening I mean you flatten a bead that's out of balance and you'll see right away how out of balance it was because flattening it exaggerates how out of balance it was and you're like oh my god that bead is now hideous right if you flatten a beautifully balanced and centered bead, you get a beautifully balanced and centered shape, flat shape, whatever it is. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that I love about this process, is that it's very consistent, okay? Oh, he went on and on and on about it, but it's kind of cool, and if you can get into it, if you can put the practice in right because you got to get comfortable uh, but people do pretty quickly you know I mean I've taught a lot of people and, and people get quick get comfortable pretty quickly um, uh, and, and then once you do you know it's like learning to play the guitar or something you know it's like muscle memory it, it's then you can just sort of get out of the way and allow for the thing to take place. If I overthink things, that's when that's when I create uh, chaos for myself. But I mean, I know how to do this process. Uh, really, the hard thing, the hardest thing, was figuring out some way to tell other people what my process was. It was in my head, um, and I knew it, but I didn't have to actually verbalize it. So when I started teaching in 2005. It was tough for me because, because you know, A, I don't like having people see things that I do that aren't yet finished because they're imperfect and that, that concerns me <laughs> for whatever reason. But also, I mean, I, I, it, it, to, to explain something to someone so that they understand it, I mean, it, does, it isn't one way of explaining. I mean, that's one of the reasons I really wanted to do this series is that, is that I hoped that I could 
create this virtual experience that is understandable because you're really seeing it from my perspective because even if you were standing in the room you'd be to one side or the other or behind me and looking you know at my process and listening to me but from a different perspective right now you're, you're literally seeing it from 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 my perspective and I've always wanted to be able to uh, realize that in in video in, in, a, in, a, in a tutorial series and so here I am this is basically video number one and I, I I hope that uh, I'm making some sense to all of my millions and millions of followers. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I don't even have one yet, but you know, hey, you got to start somewhere. So you come away from the heat. It's a it's a molten ball of glass on a stick. Amazingly, right? You come away and you don't change your series of movements at all. You want to let it go from that liquid state to a solid. It goes from orange to dark. Once it's dark, you know it's a solid, right? Still obviously very hot, but a solid nonetheless. And then, since I'm not decorating this one, um, I wait a few more moments, right? And then I put it into my insulating material. Okay, maybe something like that. Pwah. Now, the insulating material slows the cooling process so that the bead doesn't shock and break, right? If I just let, set it down here and let it cool, uh, you know, there's a high likelihood that it might break, especially if it were like a flat bead where it's got a lot of stress, that sort of thing. Um, but the thing you have to consider is um, if you, this is called Japanese cool, uh, Japanese cooling bubbles. I don't know why exactly, but that's what they call them. They used to, I used to use vermiculites, or, but if you're using vermiculite or, or cooling bubbles or fiber blanket, whatever it is, the idea is the same. If you, if you put your bead in too quickly so that it's still too hot, then the surface of the insulating material will scar the bead and that's not so nice. On the other hand, if you wait too long, then the bead might cool too much and crack. Either crack here or um, it'll crack in the kiln when you're, when you're bulk annealing later. Um, or worst case scenario, it'll crack on that beautiful you know, piece that you made and sold to somebody. And then they'll come back and give you that look, <laughs> which nobody wants to get, right? So, so if you find that your, your beads are cracking when you're, when you're removing them from the mandrels after they cooled, uh, try putting them in a little sooner, okay? If you find that beads are scarred on the surface, try waiting a little bit longer before you put them in here, okay? And they need to stay in the material, the insulating material for, you know, an hour or more uh, to be on the safe side, okay? And, I mean, I like to, if, if I'm doing a bunch of round beads, round beads are uh, very stable because whatever stress they have inside rotates around itself. Um, if it, it, round beads, boom, 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 make a whole bunch of them, stick them in here, you know, an hour from now, I'm going to, I'm going to, or whatever, I'll, I'll take them off the mandrel and, and bulk anneal them at the same time. Um, annealing is the process of putting them in the kiln, uh, heating them up from room temperature to 509 degrees centigrade, uh, which is just before the melt point. Um, and, and, and what that is, is it kind of relaxes them. It's like a glass bead massage service. Yeah. And, and it, it, it releases the internal stress inside that bead by, by getting it close to the melt point so that whatever internal stress it has, hopefully, will be uh, released. And then the kiln is turned off and it sits overnight and cools down naturally. You can come back in the morning and your beads are annealed. 
uh, and as durable as they possibly can be. If I'm making delicate beads or beads that have a lot of stress, like a flat bead, take a bead like that, but then squish it, you trap a ton of stress. So even though we flame anneal and all the rest of it, which I'll show you, um, if it's a flat bead, it still has way, a, a way higher likelihood of breaking. Okay, um, That's the kind of bead that I'm going to put directly into the kiln. I'm going to make it uh, into the kiln so it'll go from hot to hot rather than hot to cold to hot to cold. Okay, If it's delicate, do it directly into the kiln if you can. Um, otherwise, one more thing about this bit, it's not a set amount of time. You don't say, oh, okay, you have to wait five seconds, you know. The thing is, is that it, 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 the amount of glass that's being used or the type of bead that you're making uh, uh, affects how long you wait before you put it in. So uh, if it's a bigger bead, I'm going to wait a little bit longer. Um, uh, it's got more mass uh, and needs a little bit more time, I think, to cool down before you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, smaller beads, um, uh, I'm not so concerned about that. They could go in a little bit quicker. Um, if it's a flat bead, I'm concerned, if I'm putting into here, then I'm concerned that that bead is going to cool too much. So I risk uh, scarring the surface by putting it in a little bit sooner than I normally would because I want that bead to be a little bit warmer when it's sitting inside the insulating material so as to decrease the likelihood that it uh, breaks. And again, that kind of bead, usually I'll just make it directly into the kiln instead because it's just a, a more consistent way to not make broken beads, if you know what I mean.